This episode of Body Banter contains descriptions of pelvic exams and a traumatic healthcare encounter. You are listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagoya Dillin and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, joining you from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the campus of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And here with me is Shagan. And I'm joining you from UBC Okanagan on the uh, Okanagan campus uh, of UBC in Kelowna and the unceded traditional territories of the Silks Okanagan nations. And we've got a really, really important and <laughs> very um, surprising guest, maybe to some of you today. Uh, and B, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Shagan and Claudia. I'm B or Bailey Lowe, and I'm a mixed race Chinese European settler joining you from the traditional ancestral unceded and occupied lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. Thanks for having me today. Well, welcome, B. What our listeners don't know is that you're at every podcast because you are the person recording us and listening in and organizing all of the interviews and sessions. And today you're our guest. And um, it, what, a, what a treat to hear your story. Um, thank you for, for joining us. It's kind of weird being on the other side of this equation. I don't, I usually have my microphone turned off on all of this and I feel a little bit of imposter syndrome, I think. No, no, no. We all have bodies, and so we all have stories to tell about the body. And your story is really interesting because you used the body, your body, uh, to teach health professional students. Tell us about what you do. Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, in my, my day job, I work with Claudia and Shagan. Um, we record this podcast. I work at UBC as a program coordinator in the Biomedical Visualization and Communication Certificate Program. And I'm also a part-time um, graduate student. Um, but my, my side hustle, I guess, is um, working as a clinical teaching associate um, with the UBC Island Medical Program. And for those of you who don't know, a clinical teaching associate is a person who teaches health profession students how to perform sensitive exams like breast exams, pelvic exams, scrotum exams, rectal exams using their own bodies. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I do. It doesn't I don't do it very often. It happens, you know, when the the curriculum comes around to focusing on the unit um, that that relates to that. So usually it happens in September and October um, and then I come back the next year. But yeah. Can you tell us how you got into this? Because it's sort of curious um, um, and um, if you didn't tell me I would never know <laughs> that you uh, you do this. And, and, and I've had some experience, a little bit of, of myself when I had to volunteer to do, uh, to, uh, to do some examinations to allow myself to be used. Um, uh, and I feel used is pretty particularly, maybe not a good term, but where I volunteer um, as a patient um, for the benefit of teaching students. So, uh, but, but it was just an occasional thing for me. And, and I just, I'm curious about how you got into, uh, into that um, side of things uh, for yourself. Do you want to yeah. share? Yeah. Sure. So um, I think more commonly known is um, 
standardized patients are used frequently in medical schools and other health professions programs where you have a volunteer who comes and role plays a patient and a clinical scenario. And usually those are done in testing settings, um, like the OSCEs, which is a, you know, it's one type of the exam that happens in, in health profession schools. But CTAs um, are not involved in testing um, scenarios. It's, it's purely instructional and an opportunity for students to practice. Um, and I guess, I guess it's kind of convoluted how I got into this. So when I was in my undergraduate degree many years ago at Queens University, I was a sexual health peer educator. Um, I volunteered doing that, teaching sex ed to first year students. We, you know, went to bars on Saturday nights to hand out condoms. Um, we would do abortion accompaniments, um, outreach with schools and things like that. And I was always really interested in sexual health and sexual education um, and really empowering people to feel comfortable with their own bodies and their sexuality and and encouraging people to talk about it in a way that that wasn't uncomfortable or taboo. And I remember in my fourth year of school, I was reading a BuzzFeed article of all things. Um, and it was written by a person living in the United States who works as a gynecological teaching associate, as they are called um, south of the border. And I was absolutely fascinated by by this article. It was just their experience of, I think that the tagline on the article was, I, I show people my cervix for a living. Um, and I just thought it was the most interesting idea. It hadn't occurred to me that that was something that you could do. Um, but because I'm someone who's very comfortable with my own body, especially in medical settings and feeling comfortable advocating for myself in those types of settings. Usually um, I thought it might be something that I could do. It was something that I could do to um, impact the way sexual health was provided um, by starting sort of at the beginning. You start at education, you start at medical students or health profession students who are are still on their journey of learning and are new to this um, and introducing a trauma-informed, respectful, inclusive approach to these exams that can be really, really quite painful or uncomfortable for people um, and honestly can be quite negative experiences. So I, I called this person who wrote this article. Um, <laughs> I just reached out to them and said, hey, um, I read your article. It was really cool. How do I do that? How do I become to become what you do? Um, and we had, we set up a zoom meeting and we chatted about it. And I, I looked into, um, I was just basically looking for Canadian medical programs that offered this same, um, the same, um, teaching, the service. And I happened to find one at the Island Medical Program in Victoria, which was where I was living at the time. That's really interesting. And so you came from um, sort of a, a sex ed um, university volunteering to, hey, I'm comfortable with who I am and I'm comfortable in my body. And so I can um, help health professions become comfortable with their patients as well. It's still very different from handing out condoms in a bar. I mean, the yes. level of vulnerability and openness is, and is quite different. I mean, as comfortable as we may be in our bodies to have strangers poking at it and in it um, is still a whole new level of vulnerability. So how do you, um, how do you deal with that? That's a good question. Um... I'm someone who always wants to know what's going on with the body. So I, I am fortunate to have a really wonderful relationship with my family doctor. And he, he knows that I love anatomy. He knows that I like learning and education. And when I started getting um, 
receiving regular PAP exams um, when I, at the time it was indicated when I was 18, although that recommendation has now changed. Um, he was just very um, like open to talking about what was like what the different structures were and the body parts and was very he was teaching me as he was doing pelvic exams and i i'm sorry there's a siren can you hear that in the the background okay um no <laughs> um i live on a major ambulance route so um yeah he was he was just very open and encouraging me to be able to talk about it instead of just endure it and wait for it to to pass um, which I think a lot of people do in those types of exams. And I really just wanted to take that experience of me loving the experience, learning from my doctor and translate in that, that into me being able to, to help health profession students maybe be able to curate that within their own future relationships with patients. That's so amazing. And it, I mean, it really shows a level of altruism that typically we, I talk about that with the people who donate their bodies to anatomy so that uh, students can learn with those bodies from those bodies. And, um, and so you're doing it as a sort of living model for them to learn their clinical skills on. Um, that's really remarkable. Um, I know you're really passionate about representing normal body types and, and kind of challenging our concept of what is normal. So how do you do that with this experience? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I like to think of in this experience as, as being a TCTA and working with medical students in these sessions, um, reminding and framing the, the sessions as, yes, we are working with anatomy. Yes, we're working with structures, but there's also a human attached to the anatomy. There's a person with a personality and a history who's attached to that. And it's different for every single person that's gonna come and walk into your, your clinic room. Um, and so I can walk into a clinic room and I can share my own experience, but um, expecting everything to look how I look or to have the same history, medical history, or, or um, like experience as me is, as me is, is going to be totally different. And it's, you shouldn't expect that. You should expect some, something new every time, every clinical encounter. Um, I do try and present my body in a way that is not manicured for a better for lack of a better term. Um, so for example, when we're teaching pelvic exams, I, I make sure that I, I have pubic hair that is visible. I, I intentionally grow out my pubic hair for sometimes up to three months before I do a lot of prep work, um, <laughs> for this, um, because I think it's important that, that we don't perpetuate the idea that that people have to look a certain way um, and that, that you have to take care of what that anatomy looks like. Um, I know that a lot of the media representations of vulvas are completely shaved or completely waxed. And there's a lot of um, just dialogue in our society about how you have to look a certain way, um, emulate that porn star look, um, which is not reality. And if students can see what reality, one iteration of reality might be, then, then I've, you know, done my part for that. So, uh, thank you so much. And I can't really emphasize enough what, uh, Claudia said earlier about the degree of, uh, vulnerability and altruism and complete openness that, uh, doing this requires. Um, if I could just briefly share my my experience that I alluded to earlier was that um, at uh, I don't know about two years ago um, that was just when the pandemic was starting. Uh, it was February uh, and the students um, needed a, someone to demonstrate their clinical reflexes. So it was just clinical reflexes. 
So it had to be upper limb, lower limb reflexes. And so I had to come in in shorts and in a short sleeve shirt, which is not how I dress normally to, to, to work. Uh, but that was uh, what was needed on that occasion. And so the students were looking at, I mean, seeing me completely different from, you know, the normal day-to-day -day setting. And uh, and so, yeah, that, you know, it was, um, the doctor was demonstrating how you would do a biceps reflex, a triceps reflex, uh, the wrist reflex, um, the, uh, the ankle reflex, and so on. And and so um, I just re reflected. I mean, in reflection, I felt that that sense of openness, vulnerability, and this was not just my immediate local class, but it was a, a, a live stream class. So across the province, um, all the students <laughs> had the chance to see me kind of differently that day. And it turned out that one of my reflexes was depressed, <laughs> which I didn't realize uh, earlier. And so the doctor said, hmm, something is not quite right yet. <laughs> so like something that would normally happen in a doctor's room, like just behind doors, just um, eventually I, I went to my doctor and it was uh, just low vitamins and for some reason you know i was i had low vitamins and had to be corrected you know well with a a course of uh supplements anyway so reflecting on that experience i find out that yeah it i mean i completely respect what you know your honesty and openness and, and comfortable how you how far you're comfortable with your body which i think is required and I think, and I like what you said earlier about removing the taboo and removing the idealized, idealized image um, of what a body is supposed to look like and how things are supposed to go and everything has to be perfect and which does not reflect reality at all. And, and so I guess leading on from there, my question would be, um, what has, have you learned anything? Um, uh, you know, have you learned something or, you know, from this experience so far, has anything surprised you or impressed you in your work uh, in that, in that, uh, in this um, clinical teaching associate work so far? I think that what has really impressed me is, is just how, seeing how impactful these sessions are for medical students. The, the feedback that I get at the end of a session is, is overwhelmingly positive um, because a lot of a lot of the time, these are not just opportunities to practice clinical skills, but but they're opportunities for students to face their anxieties around these exams um, and have someone who, yes, I'm I'm an instructor, but I'm not. I'm not a physician. I am not their clinical preceptor. I am not their professor. I am first and foremost, a person who has, um, who has a uterus, who has a cervix and can speak to the experience of what it's like to have that. And, and my job is, is to guide them to become comfortable using language that that's inclusive, that is trauma informed, that, that isn't full of jargon um, and without judgment really is, is what's really important about these sessions is because we all know that these are, they're, they're coined sensitive exams for a reason, not just because of the, the area of the body, the anatomy that, that we're talking about, but also um, just how much care needs to go into how clinical encounters um, happen around these areas. Um, and the way our society talks about, about this, perceives all of this. So, so the, the feedback is really positive. Um, and I hear students saying that they're, they're more comfortable going out and actually trying this. Um, and, and that they have learned something and had, they hadn't had the opportunity to talk about what it's like to give care in this way with someone who who can speak to it from experience as opposed to from a clinical perspective. Well, B, I think that's, that's so important, right? Like to have a person there 
and I liked what you just said to provide care um, in that area. And I think we often think of it as we're doing a pelvic exam. It's an exam. We're doing this thing, but to frame it as providing care um, is it completely changes the conversation and the tone and and sort of the aim of what you're doing there. Um, that's that's really great. I that, that's going to stay with me. Um, so in terms of like you told about your journey with the BuzzFeed article and everything. And I mean, I remember, gosh, when I was in medical school, my first pelvic exam was on a patient. And um, I'm not sure that was that was fair to the patient, <laughs> to be honest, right? I think it would have been, I mean, it's a long time ago, right? And um, would have I would have really benefited from this experience as a student to do it in a very controlled and safe environment uh, in that way. And I remember just being extremely nervous and, um, you know, and, and very uncomfortable in, in performing this exam. Um, and at the same time, super fascinated with what I was seeing and what I was doing. So, um, you know, it's always a balance of that. And as we talk about sort of the bodily experience of, of people, um, we know that it doesn't always, it doesn't, it doesn't always work out that well, right? Um, sometimes people are not taking a care approach. Sometimes people are not using a trauma-informed uh, approach. Sometimes they're trying to be, you know, um, very scientific and we have to do this thing. We're going to insert these instruments and I will look at your cervix and I will take a sample to screen you for cancer. And now you must submit to, as I say. <laughs> and, um, and I think this sort of um, very paternalistic um, approach, unfortunately, we still see it. Um, tell us a little bit about your perspective on that and um, your experience with that, if you want to, and I guess above all, how you're changing that in the students that you teach. Yeah. So I mentioned before that I'm very fortunate to have a family doctor who is open, um, communicates really well. They, they are respectful and, and take and they take an education approach to my appointments. And that's been really great. That was kind of just what I was used to growing up. Um, as just as a, I guess, a content warning for our listeners, um, I just want to preface this, that my, my next part of the story is going to talk about um, a pretty not okay and traumatic experience that I had um, with a pelvic exam. Um and so when I was in university, I decided to have um, an IUD placed, um, which is a form of birth control where they insert a um, small little device that has the, the type that I had, um, had hormones and they insert it into the uterus um, and it stays there for several years and it prevents um, fertilization and implantation. So I decided to get an IUD and I made an appointment at the, um, at a, just like a local clinic when I was away at school because I didn't have access to my family doctor at that point. And I remember I was on the table and the exam involves a speculum exam, which is, um, it's a tool that is used to inserted into the vagina and used to visualize the cervix. And the insertion of the IUD was very painful for me. Um, and I was crying. I cried when, when it was being inserted. And the physician who was doing the procedure told me to shut up or else they wouldn't keep going. because I, you know, I had paid a lot of money for this IUD and I, you know, didn't want to have to come back and do this all over again. I just, you know, I held my tongue and I shut up and I, I finished the exam and they said, okay, we will, um, we'll just step outside. We'll come back in like a couple minutes, five minutes or so, let you get cleaned up. And I, I was just sort of left there on the exam table. Um, I was bleeding because 
uh, they had, you know, opened my cervix enough to insert this IUD. Um, there weren't any, you know, there weren't any pads or anything available to absorb the blood. So I like went to the paper towel machine and just, you know, pulled some to put it in my underwear to soak up the bleeding. And I waited there. I waited there for like 20 minutes and no one had come back in to see me. So, and I was like, I was just like shocked. I didn't know what to do. I was, I was, I was nervous that I couldn't go out for some reason. I was kind of just like stunned. And when I left, it was a big clinic and the area of the clinic that I was in had all the lights turned out and they had um, forgotten that I was in there. The, the physician never came to do a follow-up. Um, I like walked up to the reception and talked to the, um, the MOA there. And they said, oh yeah, I guess you could have gone a while ago. And, and it was just really awful. It was, it was an absolutely horrible experience. And this was a physician who served a university community um, it was actually the university's health student health services clinic. And from my work as a sexual health peer educator, I, I knew anecdotally that this clinic was very like they pushed IUDs as a, as their most commonly recommended form of, um, hormonal contraception because of its, its, its efficacy and all of these things. Um, and so I was, you know, it took me a couple of weeks to sort of process this, but I realized that if, if this clinic is, is recommending IUDs, but this is the experience, this is the so-called care that they are providing to do that for countless other students and, and patients, then that's not okay. That's, that is something that that's going to stay with those people for the rest of their lives. Um, that's something that, that I, I feel really strongly about is that, you know, a physician might do a, a pap smear. They might do a pelvic exam several times a day or several times a week. And it's just kind of normal part of their, their daily routine at work. And they do these procedures, but, you know, in the clinical recommendations for people with cervixes, um, you're recommended to get a pap smear done routinely once every three years. Like if you have a pelvic exam that is traumatic, that is disrespectful, that is harmful, and then you don't have to go back for three more years, that's going to be your impression for three whole years. It's going to totally color how you perceive the healthcare system. It's going to like change how you perceive um, physician or healthcare provider interactions. Um, and it might impact you not actually going in to get another um, pelvic exam when you're, you know, you get that letter from the cancer screening agency saying it's time to go get your next pap smear. Um, I know lots of my friends who have cervixes. Um, they just say, oh yeah, I guess I'm kind of late for that. And it's been like five years and they're refusing to go get these routine exams because they've had really negative experiences. And part of why I was so drawn to this, this role, this teaching role um, as a CTA is that because I'm comfortable with my body, because I'm comfortable usually telling um, healthcare providers what's going on for me, um, I was in a really unique position to, to do something about it. And I felt compelled to do it. Like I, I should be doing something because this can't keep happening. Thanks B. I'm really sorry you had that experience. That's awful. I mean, there's um, no excuses there. That's really, really terrible. I'm on so many levels. Um, it is a traumatic experience to be treated like that. And you took that and made yourself vulnerable again to go into an exam room uh, to teach the next generation of health professionals um, with your body on how to do it properly. That's remarkable. There's a lot of people who would just kind of say, I'm done, guys, um, not doing this. So to, 
to turn something like that into something so positive and giving back to the community in that way is is really remarkable thank you for for being you really <laughs> and um what's the funniest thing that has happened in your role as a cta the funniest thing i mean i really just love the look of astonishment and just excitement when a student sees my cervix for the first time because usually it's the first cervix that they've ever seen and it's it's like this part of the body that that is really hidden you it doesn't you know it doesn't come out for <laughs> any reasons um it and it really shouldn't yeah um and and people who have cervixes don't even see their own cervix usually um and so when they find it because sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to find you need to have the right angle sometimes it it hides, it actually kind of moves around depending on um, like how, how stimulated it has been, where I am in my cycle, um, even like the first student to go and then the third or last student to go, it's kind of in a different place between <laughs> the different exams all in a row. But when they find it, they are so excited and it's really fun to see they're like, they kind of break out of the role play of the, the scenario and say, is that it? I found it. Oh my gosh. Um, and it's, it's, it's just great. I love that. Wow. B you're my new hero. <laughs> that's, um, that's so heartwarming. That's heartwarming. And, um, and, and I can totally picture myself as one of those students because I have been there when I discovered something for the first time and, um, you know, something you've always just read about or seen in pictures or books and this having to then do the exam and, and discover for yourself the first time so it's it's a precious gift to give anyone and, and so i mean I'm, I'm i'm so in awe right now and so um you know thank you again and um and i wonder um i guess more broadly I can I kind of I think you I know what you, probably what you're going to say, but I want to hear you say that. And I, the question is, um, because in this is not uniform. Not every university or medical school does this, um, and the, you know, and people are still learning on patients uh, having their first pelvic exam on actually people who are sick or come for care. And so I'm wondering, do you have any ideas about? whether this should be rolled out, whether this should be something that should be a bit more widespread, more practiced by other schools. Um, and, and it, you know, if you were to advise on people wanting to set up that kind of program, um, how might one recruit, for example? <laughs> because if like here in the Okanagan, we do have a lot of um, difficulty sometimes recruiting patients and, and, you know, for different aspects of clinical exam. So how might you advise? How would, how would we go about rolling this kind of experience out for, for our students? I think to answer the first part of your question, yes, absolutely. I think all health professions programs that are training care providers who do these types of exams should have this type of program set in place. It's, I think it's incredibly valuable um, just to have have an instructor who who can guide you without judgment and let you practice, let you make mistakes um, in a setting that is, you know, it's lower risk than working with a patient, especially patients who are sick or or maybe have other things going on. Um, as a CTA, I'm I'm coming in with with as a healthy, normal individual with anatomy that, that this is what you would expect in a, in a normal or routine place. So yes, I think all programs should have this, um, not just medical schools, but, you know, nurse practitioners, I've worked with them. I know that midwifery students also use CTAs. Um, I think that it's an awesome program as for recruiting. Um, I mean, I think talk, like, I think talking about it is, is going to be the most effective way 
to recruit, recruit people. So you never know how many people are going to say, you know what, I could do that. I could do that. That's something that, that I'm comfortable enough with that I'm willing to do and I'm interested in, but people don't even know that this job exists, right? Like I didn't know it existed until I happened to read a random Buzzfeed article about it. Um, and it really resonated with me. And I wonder, um, I think about this, um, how many people also read that same article and then decided to say, you know what, I could do that. And then reached out to a medical school. Um, I, I want to talk about my experience more. I, I don't hide this job. It was, you know, my, when I first told my mom about it, she was a bit concerned thinking it was something other than what it really was. But, um, I do try and be really open about it and talk to people and say, you know what, the program needs more CTAs. If you are interested, do it. Um, so I think the storytelling, the word of mouth, the, the benefits to, you know, long-term impact of the way um, these exams are are provided in our healthcare field um, are really is what's going to sell it. Thanks, B. And we'll provide some links on our website, bodybanter.ca, for those who are interested in getting more information about this program. Um, B, we've talked a lot about your cervix today, um, but what's your favorite body part? It's not the cervix, actually. Um, <laughs> um, I think, I think my favorite body part, they're the kidneys, um, which is like not related to pelvic exams or <laughs> speculum exams or anything like that. Um, but the reason that I love the kidneys so much is because I used to hate the kidneys. Um, and <laughs> When I first started working with you, Claudia, I, um, I made you do something about the kidneys. <laughs> you made me do something with the kidneys. Um, yeah, I, so I, in a couple years ago, I was working with Claudia developing online modules for midwifery and I was illustrating and doing some like content design and all of that. And my module was on renal physiology and I, I just decided to sort of go for it. Um, it was something that I had really struggled with in the times that I had studied it in university. And I wanted to find a way to make it more understandable. And so I just spent so much time grappling with all the hormones in the, you know, renin angiotensin system and all that until I fell in love with it. Um, and so that's my, that's my favorite part of the body. And that module is so beautiful with your little comic book approach. We'll link to that as well. <laughs> Do you have a least favorite body part? I don't know if I have a least favorite body part. I, I, my least favorite body system is the immune system. And that's because I have a lot of food allergies. Um, I'm allergic to so many different types of foods um, and it, they're all anaphylactic. And so I'm, I'm frustrated with my own immune system for just, you know, I can't eat peanut butter. I can't eat shellfish. Um, can't eat sesame, which just makes, you know, eating some of my favorite foods really difficult. Um, so my least favorite body system is my own immune system. I can see that. I was commenting with my kids the other day that immune system and immunologists, those are the smartest people. Absolute hands down. There's a, there's absolutely no no question about that. It's so complex. I agree totally. Um <laughs> yeah. It's one of the areas where to actually master the content uh is um, it, you have to give kudos for people who do that on a daily basis and that's that's what they're experts in so yeah i, I completely agree and, and good luck with your allergies v, because i can imagine <laughs> i can imagine not being able to um, eat a lot of things um yeah maybe just one last comment from me because i know we have to round up soon again to thank you and 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 i it just occurred to me while we're discussing today's topic that and i think it's arose from some other um, comment that 
Claudia made earlier about uh, learning student students coming to learning in a safe environment. So I think what occurred to me is that that's that's what you actually do. You actually provide a safe place for students to come to learn. And by that, you're teaching them to be safe, to practice safely uh, for, with, for, for their patient, for future generations of, of patients that they will see. And, and that's such an incredible thing. And um, uh, once again, thank you so much, B, uh, for all you do, for who you are, uh, your contribution to the, to the program that we run. Um, yeah, and uh, that I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks, Shagan. Yeah, I, I feel so incredibly fortunate to have had as many positive interactions with the healthcare system that I have. Um, they far outnumber the negative experiences and that's not the case for a lot of people. And, and so I just, I just want to do my part to, to change that for other people and hopefully they can have more experiences like I have. Well, I'm pretty sure that you are having that impact and making that change um, for the students that you teach and their patients. So that multiplies quite quickly. So you're having an impact on hundreds and thousands of patients and uh, clinical exams. Thank you so much for talking about your body and uh, your experience with your body and how um, we can use our body to teach and how to create safety around that. And um, thank you so much. What a, what a treat to talk with you. And that concludes today's episode of Body Banter. I'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <music>